Hey everybody, how's it going? Hope you're all good. Hope you're all well. Welcome back to another episode of the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast with me, your host, Harry Simiu. And on today's episode, we've got a few subjects to discuss. We're going to talk Leandro Trossard. We're going to talk Eberece Eze. We're also going to talk Milos Kerkes, the Bournemouth fullback, making some headlines. And we're going to discuss Victor Gyokares again. And there's a reason for that. Don't worry, I'm not just trying to stoke a fire that isn't actually burning. There's a reason that I feel like we need to at least pay attention to what's being said about him at the moment. So we'll get into all of that on this edition of the show. It is another pre-recorded edition, um, which means that there isn't that opportunity for you guys to throw questions into the live chat whilst we're doing the podcast. But what I will ask is that if you are watching us on YouTube, if you're listening to us on audio via whichever platform it is that you're joining us, please do leave me some questions and we'll pick them up on Monday's episode of the Chronicles of Agoon. I'm really, really looking forward to being back live with you all once again. But anyway, let's start off today's episode with Leandro Trossard, the Belgian dropped uh, by Roberto Martinez last night. He didn't start the game against Romania. And all I kept hearing in the commentary was about how much more balanced, actually, uh, this Belgium side looked, which I think is a little bit harsh, given Leandro Trossard is one of their most effective players. Kevin De Bruyne is always going to be in there when, when fit, of course. Romelu Lukaku has significant importance to that side. Yuri Tielemans, who was one of the players that was brought into the starting eleven, actually... Um, you know, was the one that scored the opening goal, uh, put them in front really early on. So obviously played a huge part. So that decision, I guess, to the to that point was justified. There were, however, some accusations um, of maybe Leandro Trossard just being a bit wasteful last night, taking an extra touch when he probably didn't need to. Uh, there was an opportunity, uh, from what I remember, where he probably should have squared it to a teammate and he opted to go for an effort from a difficult position. And that didn't go down too well either. Um, but the kind of wider conversation around Belgium has been, you know, the golden generations may be somewhat past a little bit. And we're at a place now where they have a good attacking force of players. Perhaps defensively, they're a little bit weak. They're a little bit frail. But although they lost their opening game to Slovakia, I thought they played quite well in that game. And they certainly carved a load of chances out against Romania last night. So I guess the wider question is, could Leandro Trossard and Belgium go on and be crowned European champions at the end of this summer? To be honest with you, I don't think they can. Um, and the reason I'm, I'm touching on this is because somebody asked me a few days ago in the comments section, given they've got Trossard, given they've got De Bruyne, and he mentioned various others, Jeremy Doku as well, Yuri Tielemans. Are they serious contenders? And having watched them twice now, I think they're as fluid as anybody going forward. I think they are good enough to open most teams up. Do they have the killer instinct in front of goal? You know, people would argue Romelu Lukaku is that. He's the all-time leading Belgian goal scorer. And he has scored goals wherever he's been throughout his career, Romelu Lukaku. But I'm never 100% convinced about him. But I guess the bigger concern and the bigger worry is actually going the other way. They look really, really fragile. The amount of times that Romania carved through them with such ease and but for some better finishing, you know, it could have been a very, very different outcome last night. So for me... Belgium are exciting. They're fun to watch. I'd rather Trossard was in the team than not. But look, if it protects him a little bit ahead of preseason, then I guess it's not the worst thing in the world. Um, but yeah, do I think they can win it? No, I don't. So um, yeah, interesting. It'd be interesting to see if Leandro Trossard finds his way back in to the starting 11. I'd, I'd imagine that given that there's still so much at stake going into the final game, they, of course, uh, play Ukraine. And given that the performance in terms of going forward felt so much more fluid last night against the Romanians than it did against Slovakia, I'd imagine that Trossard probably will find himself on the bench again, which is unfortunate. 
for him. Let's move on, though, to our next story. Bournemouth's Milos Kerkez is a player that continues to be linked with a move to Arsenal. Now, we discussed him a little while ago. Um, the tweet that I've highlighted is one uh, from an account that was focusing on Manchester United's interest in him. But Arsenal are mentioned in this, and that's why I thought it was worth discussing. Also worth mentioning that this isn't the only source that is crediting Arsenal with an interest in the Hungarian fullback. He is at the Euros, of course, at the moment. He is a player that really did wonders for his reputation last year with some real solid performances under Andoni Iraiola at Bournemouth. I saw him live on, I think, three or four occasions last season, and I always thought he looked a pretty decent fullback. The only question mark I have over this is, you know, is he the type of fullback that Mikel Arteta is looking for? There's no doubt that he's a good one. There's no doubt that we're in the market probably for a left back. We've said that over and over again. It feels like a bit of a problem position, a position where we've had to chop and change quite a bit. And yeah, you want to have that flexibility. And we know that Mikel Arteta, for example, is quite happy to use Zinchenko against certain opposition, happy to use uh, Tommy Asu against others where he wants to go with a more sort of man marking kind of approach where there's a particular threat that he's looking to nullify. But all of those guys are kind of not left backs by nature. So Zinchenko will go into the midfield and join in. You look at Tommy Asu and yeah, he does try and go into the midfield and join in sometimes because that's what he's asked to do. Doesn't really look quite right. Jakub Kivior played there on occasions last season as well. And obviously Jurian Timber's back. So we've definitely got options there, but it does feel like a, a position where we haven't got a, a, a solid option, someone that is the go-to, and maybe that's the next step in terms of fixing that. My question would always be around Kirkes, though, and, and it's nothing to do with his talent. It's nothing to do with his level. It would be around whether he's the profile of fullback that Arteta is going for, because we've seen him shift from traditional fullbacks to um, sort of less orthodox fullbacks, fullbacks that are centre-halves in stature, and Milos Kerkes certainly isn't that. He is your old-school left-back that wants to get up and down the flank. And in that case, you know, I guess you could kind of compare him to Kieran Tierney, who obviously will be returning to the club as far as we know at the moment. The view is to sell him, but, you know, that's not happened yet. He's picked up another injury at the Euros, Kieran Tierney, which isn't great. But the point I'm trying to make here is that if Kieran Tierney could make it at Arsenal because we just decided to go down a different path in terms of our approach from that position, then does Milos Kerkes really fit the bill? That's my reservation about this. When I read that Arsenal are interested, and this comes from Bence Boschak, who um, is, of course, uh, a well-respected journalist, um, works for a fair few reputable companies, The Guardian, the World Soccer Mag, Goal, Daily Mirror, uh, has appeared on the BBC on Talk Sport, formerly worked at Reach. So, you know, he's someone with plenty of credibility. He highlights United's interest, but he does mention that Chelsea and Arsenal are all keeping an eye on the player. Let me know your thoughts on this one. Have I got a point in that traditional fullback? How does he fit in at Arsenal? That's where I'm a little bit stuck on this one. But you never know. Maybe Mikel Arteta is going to go down a new route next season. <laughs> Moving on to our next story, we're going to talk Eberece Eze, who, of course, is also at the European Championships with England at the moment. Now, we know that Crystal Palace are on the verge of losing Michael Elise to uh, Bayern Munich. He's made his decision to go there. We've discussed that on some recent episodes of the show. And I know that a lot of Arsenal fans are huge admirers of Eberece Eze. First of all, from a Crystal Palace point of view, if they were to lose both of them, having shown such promise under Oli Glasner at the end of last season. That would be a real hammer blow, wouldn't it? I mean, I guess it would give them significant funds to reinvest and maybe that would go some way in, in Glasner sort of starting to mould the team more in his image. But to lose two huge talents like Olise and then possibly Eze as well would be a problem and would set Crystal Palace back. There's no doubt about that. Now, according to multiple reports, he does have a release clause of £60 million. And it's been suggested that in order for that release clause to be triggered, £50 million of that would need to be paid up front. Now, this particular article or tweet that I'm showing you on the screen, for those of you watching, is from Eduardo Hagen, and he's credited it to Alex Goldberg. 
and ZRAFC is also named in there as well. Team News and Ticks was talking about Eberiche Eze and Arsenal's admiration for him. He talked about the fact that Arsenal, um, you know, have been interested in this player for a while. have been watching him from afar for quite some time now and that he could well be on the radar. He could well be someone that they move for this summer. So I don't know who reported it first. So I don't want to say it was Alex Goldberg. I don't want to say it was ZRAFC and I don't want to say it was Team News and Ticks. I don't want to give any of them the credit because I don't know who deserves it. And that way I can't get in trouble, right? But I think it's interesting that um, Eberiche Eze appears to be on Arsenal's list. It, it also goes on to say, um, in the piece that Alex Goldberg uh, did specifically, that Arsenal see him as a left winger or a left central midfielder. So that could mean that he could fill in in that left eight spot in certain games, um, which would then allow you to maybe use Declan Rice in a deeper position. Ultimately, we want options. We want versatility. We want to be able to shuffle the pack. I do think the problem we had in the left eight position last season at times particularly before Partey's return and before we started utilising Jorginho in the midfield and giving Rice that role. I have to say that we had a bit of an issue in terms of creativity. Yes, Kai Havertz was making runs from deep and that's great because that's what his game is. But we lacked that killer pass. We lacked that line breaking ability. We had someone that could run through the lines and could transition through the thirds but somebody else needed to pick him out and that was where I felt like we just struggled a little bit aside from the fact that we couldn't move it through the lines from deeper areas too it didn't help us having Havertz at left eight affected and impacted our fluency and I don't think that Eberiche Eze being in the team would give you the same issues I think that he would add to that I think he would give you that bit of flair not sure about him on the defensive side of things, but that would be because I haven't watched him as much as the Crystal Palace fans. They might tell me that, no, that's not an issue. They might tell me he's absolutely fine to be a part of an aggressive Arsenal press. We'll have to wait and see if indeed this does turn into something. But according to multiple sources now, Arsenal are monitoring Eberiche as a situation. The question mark is over whether they see him as a player of that value and whether Arsenal are willing to go and drop a significant amount of money on a player of this profile. We know what the release clause is. We know it's around about £60 million. If you want him, you've got to pay it. Um, but it looks like you're going to have to pay at least £50 million of that up front. So these are just reports at the moment. So don't get carried away. But it does feel like he is an option for Arsenal. How advanced or... Um, you know, strong this interest is, I couldn't possibly tell you because I'm going by what other people are saying. Um, but from my personal perspective, I'd quite like to see Eberiche Eze come in. I'd have been okay with seeing Michael Elise come in as well, to be honest. I like both of them as players, but I do think it's really, really important that we define what their roles are going to be and that we bring them in for that purpose and we don't bring them in and start trying to put them um, into awkward positions and and, and trying to turn them into something that they're not, because they both feel to me like players that you need to take the shackles off of and allow to go and roam and play their game. And we are a lot more structured than a lot of teams. And I know people talk about the fluent, fast-paced football that we play, but we are incredibly structured as well. And I just wonder if players like Eze, players like Olise, who are that kind of maverick type of player that just wants to get on the ball, roam around and and sort of make things happen, I do wonder if in Arsenal system you can get away with that. Think about Manchester City, right? You know, they brought Jack Grealish in. This is just an example. Who was this type of player that I'm talking about? Who would pick up the ball, who would carry it, who would take on people, who would want to grab the game by the scruff of the neck and, and look to force issues. Unfortunately for him, having gone to Manchester City, he just became a part of a system. And that individuality that Jack Grealish possessed, what made him so great and what earned him a £100 million move in the first place. I think to a degree, and I know he's got the medals to, to prove that he's progressed, but it does feel like on an individual level, it took something away from him. It feels like the spark, you know, has gone out when it comes to Jack Grealish. And what I really don't want to see is that happen to Eze, is that happen to Elise, because they go to clubs where it's system first, rather than being big fish in small ponds, that therefore have the freedom of the pond and can go out and express themselves week in, week out. Would you take Eberiche Eze for £60 million in total? Let me know your thoughts 
in the live chat box. I say live, it's not live. In the comment section below, I should say. <laughs> okay, and on to our final story of the day. I know it seems like I'm going on and on and on and on about this Giocares report from Leonino in Portugal, uh, an outlet that a lot of people would say actually isn't that reputable and until the big papers in Portugal pick this up, perhaps we should stay calm and we shouldn't get sucked into this. We should protect ourselves against falling into this trap. And I agree with all of that, right? But what I find fascinating about this from Leonino is that they went with it one day. They said that the financial details were all that was missing. And then the next day, they said that a deal had been agreed that was up to the value of around about 90 odd million euros and that Arsenal would have add-ons in that deal that could potentially see the fee rise up to 120 million euros, which is above Victor Giocares' release clause, which I think is about 100 million euros. So we kept, so we heard the first thing. They come out, they say it. They say a deal's happened, it's close, whatever. Then they come out with a second bit of information. Nobody else in the meantime, by the way, is reporting this. Nobody else, which makes me think, how credible is this and how much can I believe this? But rather than backing away or toning it down a little bit, Leonino are going in even harder and they continue to push this story, adding more detail today by saying that George Mendes, the famous football super agent, is the one acting as the intermediary to bring Victor Giocares to Arsenal. The deal, according to sources, is close to being completed after negotiations, and I quote, advanced rapidly in recent days and it's expected that there will be news by the end of the month well we've only got seven days until the end of the month so we're going to find out very shortly aren't we if leonino um uh, you know have, have got this right or if they're barking up the wrong tree if they're um leading us down the wrong path again i'm going to advise caution on this i'm not getting carried away by it i'm not uh, believing it completely, to be honest. But because they keep doubling down on it, they doubled down and then they went and tripled down. And now you're starting to think, hold on a minute. Do they know something that we don't? I'm going to be really keeping a close eye on this. Is Victor Giocares the striker that you want to see come in this summer? We've talked about a few over the course of the summer so far. Um, and as I always say, if something advances, we will bring you one of our scouting report episodes We've got one in the works at the moment. Yusuf Fofana, I'm about halfway through putting it together. So that'll be with you um, this week. I probably should have dropped it last week, but just never got around to sitting down for another couple of hours and finishing off uh, the research on him. The Euros has taken over my life. Um, but yeah, there's less games a day now. So maybe um, I'll be able to get off the couch a little bit more and, um, and uh, focus on what I actually should be focusing on, which is bringing you guys uh, daily Arsenal content. Um, so, yeah, let me know what you think on that. Are Leonino onto something or do you feel like this is just a bit of old Codswallop, to be honest with you? I don't know. Let me know in the comments section below. Make sure you leave a like on the video if you haven't done so already. It really, really does help. If you're listening on audio, leave us a review. That also really, really helps. Subscribe, because I think at the time of recording this, we're only about 10 subscribers away on YouTube from hitting 34,000. Um, and once we get there, then we can start pushing towards the 35,000 mark, which I'd love to get to ahead of the new season. That's kind of the target that I want to set myself. So please uh, do get involved, do help out. Let us know your thoughts on all the stories we've discussed today in the comments. And I'll be back with the next one tomorrow. Until then, take care of yourselves and enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Goodbye.